without a break day and night. It happened to be that one of the sisters was in our class. And my last first Mass, as it were, was with them. And I did notice that behind the altar was this verse, I consecrate myself. Now, people have meditated all over the centuries as to the meaning of this word, this word consecrate, in that context of the high priestly prayer. Certainly in the context of a place of perpetual adoration, one cannot but think of the Eucharistic consecration itself, where the Lord has, by that consecration, made himself present unto us and has invited us to intimacy with him as though we were present in the upper room ourselves. But then there is the specificity of the question that he's talking about the truth, being consecrated in truth or in the truth. The question of truth is fundamental throughout the Gospel of St. John. Not to live in the truth is not to live in the light. But to live in the light is to be in the dark. And we notice that in this same Gospel of St. John, somewhat earlier, Judas, of whom there is a question in this, goes out and it is night. And he here is referred to as the son of perdition. That's a Hebrew way of putting it. 
one is a son of something. Elijah is described as a son of hares in the old writing that refers to him in the book of Kings. And so it is that the son of perdition is someone who is belonging to perdition. It's rather sad. One can look around the planet now and want to detect that there are some who are living in darkness by the way they react to the light. They push it away and they maybe are also sons of darkness, therefore sons of perdition. No one goes there except, as this new translation has it, the one who chose to be lost. But to be safe we need truth, and only the truth. This was perceived by the saint of this day, who is a very interesting figure. He gave his whole life to searching for the truth and then proclaiming it as he saw it. Some years ago I was in the place where he was born. There is a Christian presence there, Nablus and the area around. This is homemade there by the Christian community in the area but it has underneath it St Justin Church. It is made very simply from a bit of wood. Our Blessed Lady is there, and St Joseph, the Holy Family, and the cross in the midst. Now, it is a fascinating area. I was talking to a priest of the area. We were sitting together on a wall outside the church that he had just completed building. He had a beard and he was an Eastern Orthodox priest and he was telling me how his predecessor had suffered to get that church built. When he had been there in the area, Jacob's Well, in 1976, told to go there by my novice master before entering the monastic life, there was no church there, just the well in the open air. When we got there now, some years ago, there was a beautiful church just being completed. But on one of the walls was an icon, a contemporary icon, of the predecessor of that priest who had been martyred in the building thereof. There are high tensions in the area, and if one recuperates a holy place of another body of believers, another religion, one can expect a certain reaction. But in this case it was quite angry, and he was martyred by being axed to death, I believe. Axes or hatchets, that was in the, in the icon, and we were given a description of it by the successor who managed against threats actually to complete it with great courage and so Christian prayer was able to go on there even though it was somewhat surrounded by tension. The Holy Land is a place of great tension to this day and it is a minefield that can actually very quickly explode and should that happen no one knows what the consequences might be. In fact, the Lord knew the danger that was ahead because he did cry out from the depths of his heart as he approached the holy city itself, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, the city that stoned the prophets that did not know what pertained to its peace, playing precisely on the word itself, Yerushalayim, vision of peace. This saint, therefore, was born of pagan parents, Roman or Greek, Eustinus is a Latin name, and the present area is called Nablus. The old Roman name would have been Flavia Neapolis, and it's the area of Sichem. <coughs> 
he's an early witness and very important for that fact. He himself gave his life to study. He consulted various philosophies, Stoic, Peripatetic, Pythagorean, Platonic. But in his travels he came to Asia Minor and to Ephesus, which by the way is an interesting place even to this day in Christian history. And the Muslims there are actually quite respectful to the Christian pilgrims and the place is maintained well because of the link with our Blessed Lady and the council that was held there, which proclaimed her, of course, Theotokos, Mother of God, which actually is an imperfect translation of the word Theotokos. It means birth giver of God, De genetrix or De para. And there, a wise man gave him a bit of advice, and this is interesting how a bit of advice can go a long way when a person is genuinely wanting to know. The key in Justin is that he genuinely wanted the truth, and he was not bigoted, prejudiced, he wanted the truth. Rather like Newman, actually, and he did not sin against the light. But Ephesus he met a wise man who directed him to the study of the Old Testament. Now let's remember that at this time the body that we call the New Testament is only just coming into its canonical form. The early Christians were using the scriptures that were there already. Tanakh. He was told, you are a lover of beautiful speech. That's the art of oratory, rhetoric, and it's interesting that in a strange dream or vision that Jerem had, St. Jerem, he found himself being beaten and being told, Quits, what are you? And he answered, Christianus sum, and was being told, non Christianus, said Ciceronianus, a Ciceronian, this element of cultivated oratory and language. But then this wise man went on, you are a lover of beautiful speech, but you are certainly not a friend of action or of truth. By that he meant putting it into action and the truth itself being learnt and practised. He converted to Christianity around the year 130. Now there are some conversions which are going to be important in church history and this is one of them and went to Rome. We notice how people drift towards Athens and Rome, and like St. Paul before him, he's well able to hold his own when he gets to these centres, the Oxford and Cambridge of the time. Paul of Tarsus is able to use their own poets and quote them, and get through to them in their own language and culture, Greek of course. But now it's coming to Rome. It's going to be important. The Western Bloc is going to operate in Latin. where he opened, notice, a school. So he's working within the body of culture, and that's what many Christians do professionally. They work within culture. And by the way, there's something about that in the use of, for instance, using modern means of getting the word out, as Benedict wanted, get in there, and also of getting within, for instance, the body of literature if one can produce on the level of what is out there, for instance, poetry and beauty, then one can use that indirectly to get to those who are not looking for anything specifically Christian, but just for something cultural. And that is a bridge. Culture is a bridge. Many of the early Christians were uneducated, but Justin believed that if the Christian teachings were properly explained, many more persons would embrace the faith. It is our duty, he said, to make known our doctrine. And that is what he did. Now he was very daring in doing so, because there was the discipline of the Arcanum, the 
Christians were not allowed to say what was going on and exactly what the nature of the Eucharist was. And that led to their being defamed as cannibals. People had a bad understanding of bits of stuff that had leaked out. So he gave us one of the earliest testimonies of what actually happened and it's very close to what we have. The pattern is essentially the same as what it was in the early church. And the Second Vatican Council wanted that the main lines of liturgy should be visible again, therefore simplifying the overgrowth. And therefore we do see now very clearly that it is the same main lines that are there. The structure essentially is the same. Only a few of his written works have come down to us, two apologies, and his doctrine with Trifo the Jew. Now he's coming of course from the Holy Land, he has had contact with the Jews, and he has to do with the philosopher emperor himself, Marcus Aurelius. Of course that <clears throat> can backfire, and it does, he's going to end up martyred. It's, by the way, interesting that these early Christians were martyred because they were regarded as, as it were, non-believers in the official guards. And that was seen as a threat, quite often, to the system because the guards were seen to be the defenders of the empire. At his execution, six other Christians were martyred with him five men and one woman, what well, one woman, and we have the details of it, and we have the words that he uttered with Rusticus, the prefect, and he speaks with great dignity defending himself. These are read at the Office of Readings. When threatened with torture, said Rusticus, He's pointing out, therefore, what's ahead if he doesn't conform. He gets to the point. But calmly, Justin replied, We hope to suffer torment for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved. Because the, pre or the prefect is trying to pull out of him what he thinks he'll gain from being tortured. And whether he thinks he'll get anything at the end. And of course, calmly, the martyr knows what is waiting him at the end. The antiphon for the Magnificat quotes the words of Justin himself. Suddenly my soul caught fire, and I became filled with love for the prophets and those men who are the friends of Christ. Now we see here how there's this ignition in the soul when the truth is found. He caught fire. This resonance. I remember actually when I saw the Catholic truth really clearly for the first time, that was something I felt too, this is it, it has to be, and it ignites. And nothing else then can be true after that. It's true in its totality, and the rest then follows. In the Canticle of Lords, the Benedictus, we have this antiphon, also an echo of his thought and writings. Every, in every sacrifice, let us praise the Creator of all things, through his Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit. So here we are again, the appeal to the universal experience of the God. Let us remember that these were able to just defend the truth by the power of the truth itself. And Benedict XVI pointed out very clearly that the truth has no need of anything more violent, more noisy at all than the power of its own truth to defend itself. And if one sees that a person is becoming noisy and violent to defend his truth, it means he's nervous. He's appealing to other means. The person has serene possession of the truth and knows all the elements of it, is not afraid by any argument because he sees. Opinion is not the same as belief. And therefore, if we're handing 
on the truth, we're not handing over opinions, but if a person is discussing what he sees to be the truth, but in fact he's handling his own opinions, it's a different issue altogether. One has to see what's going on. And in church life, there's a lot of defense of opinions as though they were the truth. Again, we need to see what's going on. A truth, the truth, is either true or not. Opinions are perceptions of it, and they can be pale. Opinor is to think. People think, but they're not given all the information. With regard to where we find the information, if one is going towards a vocation, one needs to be aware that one has to pray for light as to where to go, because one does not have to spend one's time in a place where one is trying to defend the truth against opinions which are being given as the truth. And even be excluded from ordination, or whatever it might be, for doing so. One needs to know that there are certain places that one can go to, and are clearly under the Lord's blessing. In the English-speaking world, it's as well to be aware that there is, for instance, the movement of the Oratory of St. Philip Neri, of which one saw it the other day on his feast, 26th of May. It's blessed by the Lord, and one can have Orthodox liturgy and Ministry of Souls, but also a truly contemplative life like St. Philip Neri in the Oratory itself, as the name suggests. It's a good blend, and one can be kept safe there from being obliged to go against one's conscience. It is worth being aware that the Lord is free to bless a place that honours him. And so it is that every culture has its alternatives, and we need to be aware that that is where one can be safe in worshipping the Lord as he wants. It's not good for a soul to have to always do violence to its conscience, Therefore, go with the grain, rather against it, and be serene. It's a waste of time and life to spend all one's time going against the grain. Yeah. 